Then you'll know just what to do if you still want me. If sing it with me. Want me. Oh, tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. It's been three long years. Do you still want me? And I won't see you yet round the old oak tree. I'll get on the bus, forget about us. Put the blame on me if I don't see a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. All right. One of my jobs, I just think, is to keep teaching the classics, whether it be Andy Griffith or Tony Orlando and Dawn. All right. Number one hit, 1973, that actually took on prominence again in the early 80s. I don't know if you remember this was happening, those of you that were around and knew what was going on. We had hostages in Iran, and uh, as a result of that, people wanted them to come home, and they were praying for it. And do you remember this? The ribbons, the yellow ribbons that were tied around trees all over this country as a way of saying, we want them to come home. And it's a beautiful picture of something that uh, uses something solid, which is an oak tree, as this is something solid, this is something that we're holding on to, and something, almost a picture of grace, please, would you, we're remembering them, we're thinking of them, and we want them to come home. And it was, uh, it was beautiful to see that, even in our neighborhoods in Chicago, I remember yellow ribbons all over the place, and you probably had them uh, in your neighborhood, too, and it was just a great thing that took on a life because of this song. Well, in a moment, we're going to be looking at a parable, the first parable in the Bible that uses trees to communicate some truth. And I'm looking forward to this, but I really want you to take your Bible and open it, if you would, to Judges 9. We've got the most verses of any chapter, so we're going to motor through. So please take a Bible. If you don't have one, please get one out of the pew rack there and open it up, and it's going to show you some things. It's going to teach you some things that uh, the Lord wants uh, to do, teaching us these things from, from his book. And I want to pray, and then I want to get into this because we got 57 verses and I think we're going to we're going to enjoy this time together at least I'm hoping that's the case. Father, thank you again for your faithfulness to the word uh, that you meet these needs. You teach us much about ourselves. And uh, so because of that, we come to you again this morning asking you to use these true stories inspired of you. Uh, you said in the book of Romans that these things were given to us to teach us, to um, challenge us, to encourage us. And then your son also, as he was walking on that road after he had rose from the dead, he's walking with those disciples, and he went from the beginning uh, through the law, through the prophets, and he showed them himself. And so as we see this, I'm asking God that you would use this, um, this story to help us to see uh, Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. title of today's message is What Goes Around Comes Around, and we come to this time again where Israel has fallen into adultery, but this is a kind of a different start, uh, and I want you to look at that. Uh, point number one is destruction happens. If you want to take notes, there's a first point there, destruction happens, and we're seeing, now we're seeing with the judges, it's getting worse. What's happening with the judges is it's getting worse. We know that uh, there's no king in Israel, and we know that everybody is doing right in their own eyes, all right? But we don't see the thing where it says, and Israel did this thing of following after these false gods. What we see is that now they're not getting problems from outside, whether it be the Midianites or other um, groups of people. They're getting problems from inside. And look at this uh, verse 1. Now Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, now remember Jeroboam is, that's another name for Gideon. Throughout this chapter, you're not going to see the name Gideon anymore. He's called Jeroboam, and it's one who contends with Baal. And so Abimelech, which if you remember last week, he said what his name means, and that is, my father is king. But Gideon had been offered the kingship, and they said, 
And he, he said, no, I don't want that. Well, now look at what his son is doing. Now, Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives. Now, this is important to hear. And said to them and to the whole clan of his mother's family. If you remember, this one son was one from a concubine. And what a concubine was this? A concubine was part usually of a, of a, of a group of people that had been conquered. A man takes this woman is intimate with her, she has a child, and that child and her stay in her parents' home. So that's what's going on. He would go and visit her when it was convenient for him. It's not his wife. He is a son of Gideon or Jeroboam, but he doesn't have the same rights, it seems. And so we're going to see what happens with this attitude in um, Abimelech. So he goes back to his mother's family in Shechem, and look what he says. Look, verse 2. Say in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam, so Gideon's a busy guy, all right, 70 sons rule over you, or that one rule over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. So get the picture of what he's doing. He's going back to Shechem, and he's saying, now would you rather, and by the way, if you guys never watch um, political speeches, God bless you, but you know what happens when politicians get together and how you, just some of these latest debates and how they attack one another. Well, he shows up, and he's, he's political here, and he says, what would you rather have? Would you rather have one person rule you? And, and by the way, I'm of your flesh and blood. I am part of you, you people. Yeah, my dad was a Jew. I'm not even going to mention that to you. But, um, or have all 70 of these people vying for the leadership in your life. And he starts planning these lies. And I don't know if, I know that never happens in our day with politics, but there are people that do this and they plant these and they say all this bad stuff and they'll say all these things that you're like, yeah, it would be bad if there were 70 people. It's a lot of money. They might be all the things he formulates. And then I'm, I'm with you. I'm from the hood, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm, with, I'm from your area. You know me, okay? So, they didn't say that, but anyways, let's keep going. You guys understand. Look at verses 3 and 4a. And his mother relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of Balbareth, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. So get the picture. They say, yeah, that wouldn't be good. And so the, in Shechem, which is a place that should have had godliness and things like that, they now have set up a place of worship for Baal. And so they go into their temple, and they get 70 um, coins, which somehow, it's not a ton, a ton of money, but it's enough to almost representing, we're going to take this and we're going to get behind your campaign. And so what does Abimelech do? He hires these guys that are pieces of work. He says, uh, the, the Bible calls them worthless and reckless fellows. Worthless means wicked, poor, empty, vain, reckless, lascivious, proud, those with loose morals. So these are bad people. And Abimelech calls them to himself, and he gets them to do something for him. Look at verse 5. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the son of Jeroboam, 70 men on one stone. 
But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. And so it's almost like a ritualistic public execution thing going on where this stone is set up and all 70, the, the leaders in Shechem and uh, these reckless fellows are doing this and it's at the agreement of all these people. So you see what's going on. And you've got to wonder that maybe Abimelech was a guy that felt like he was disrespected by, by his brothers because he wasn't full-blooded, whatever. He wasn't the way that he was a son of a concubine, and so he feels bad, and, and so he doesn't care, and he wants to be king. Let's keep going. Verse 6. And all the leaders of Shechem came together, and all Beth Milo, and they went and they made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar at Shechem. So this is a place that had been set aside for holy things back in the day. Uh, many link it back to Abraham. Places that should have been used for God and his glory, now evil things are happening. Okay? So, and it's an oak tree, so that's a picture of power we just got done talking about. Now remember, there's one guy that's escaped. Jotham or Jotham, okay? Point number two, denouncement happens. Denouncement happens. Look at verse seven. When it was told by Jotham, he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and cried aloud and said to them, now I want you to get a picture. If you have your Bibles with your maps in it, you can look in, but I'm going to show you here over in this section in West uh, Manasseh, I don't know if you guys over there can see it, but if, you, if you're mapping your Bible, you'll see there's two mountains, okay? There's Mount Gerizim, and there's Mount Ebal, and there's Shechem at the base of it. And what would happen, and this happened in, during the law, there would be blessings and cursings that would be said out to, across the mountain, back and forth. You see that in the book of Deuteronomy going on. Well, he, Jotham, escapes, and he runs up to the top of Mount Gerizim and people have been there and they found out that this is a natural amphitheater because some of you are like, these guys are yelling on mountains, who's listening to them, all right? But, and by the way, it's not necessarily like Everest, okay? It's, it's high enough so that they're, they're all up there and they also say that at Mount Gerizim, it's kind of cool, if you can get that picture from Lion King, is it Rafiki that lifts up? Uh, yeah, okay, now that's, the people are amening this, okay? And... Uh, <laughs> But it's like there's a natural pulpit that comes out on Mount Gerizim. And Jotham, who has escaped, he gets out there and he starts saying this stuff to the people of Shechem. And look what he says. That's why I want you to keep looking at the word here because it's important. He goes to the top and he cries loud and he says, Listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, that God may listen to you. So he's giving them a warning. And then look what he does. And I want you to notice on the communion table here, I've got some things that represent what he's trying to get across in the picture. He says, the trees, so you got the trees out here. This is a parable. He's trying to communicate a truth. The trees once went out to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree, verse 9, said to them, Shall I leave my abundance by which gods and men are honored and go, go hold sway over the trees? And so if you can imagine an olive tree, which is huge in Israel, um, the Mount of Olives. Uh, you go there and you've got olive oil everywhere and it, there's so many uses of it for healing, for um, food for cooking, for anointing a king. And so the, the trees have this, they're crying out in desire for uh, looking for a king. And so they go and the olive tree turns them down. Says, no, I don't, I don't need that. I like what we do. And it brings honor to God and men. Okay? Look what else. Then he says, and then the trees said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go hold sway over the trees? 
and all I could find was fig like Newtons. All right. I tried to get figs. Kim was looking. We, I went to every store in Walmart <laughs> in Warrington. <sighs> they all know where my heart is. Um, every store, schnooks, figless. In fact, I asked one of the guys working in produce, do you have any figs? What's a fig? <laughs> I'm sorry, those of you that love schnooks, all right. But these are the people that we have. No. Um, <laughs> and, but if you've ever had a fig, they are good. <laughs> Amen. Um, yeah, and they're good. They're fantastic. Just off the tree, boom. They're really good. And he, they're saying, olive tree, nope. I don't, we don't need that. Isn't it interesting sometimes those that pursue leadership, what they're like, instead of people look at, no, you're a leader. We acknowledge you're a leader as opposed to those that are constantly pursuing it. So we've got olives. We've got figs. Let's keep going here. Some of you are excited about the next one. All right. And the tree said to the vine, you come and reign over us. You come and reign over us. Okay. And, he, and the tree said to the vine, you come. But the vine said to them, shall I leave my wine that cheers God and men and go hold sway over the trees? The wine turns them down. These are solid trees. Lastly, then all the trees said to the bramble, you come reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in good faith you are anointing me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. Bramble is like thorn bushes and gross, and they're only good for burning and hurting, okay? And they don't grow very high. So a tree saying, that to olive, okay, maybe that could, a olive tree could, maybe a fig tree, maybe uh, the vine growing higher. This is like ankle high, knee high at the tops, and it's lying to the trees. It's saying, if you do this, then I'm in, and I'll even give you shade. It can't do that. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So we see here that the tree is being um, duped. And he even, Jotham is even being kind to those in Shechem by calling these leaders um, cedars of Lebanon. So he's barking out all of this stuff and he's saying to them, this is not only a parable, it's a prophecy. And he's warning him, who you put in leadership in your life will have bearing in your life of how your life turns out. And he's calling Abimelech thorns and thistles. And he's promising you stuff and he's lying. And I want to give you and I a warning today. Who are you making king of your life? Who's king of your life? And don't you want a kind king? By the way, there was a king in Israel. It's God. And he's not being recognized as that. Isn't it interesting? You said that thing this morning as you were talking about God working through things. And you said, basically, God's going to do it. You have no control. And we can raise our fist and be angry at him. And, and the world can, you're not going to be my king. Stuff like, at some point, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, I'd rather do it now. And so these people are buying into lies. And don't you see it constantly in our culture? Don't you see it where you, there's people that actually believe this thing is good. This thing is okay. And they're allowing those things to be what they, how they would, you've got your truth and I got my truth. It don't work that way. There's truth. There's things we can bank on. 
And the bramble bush has lied, and it's made all these promises. And so Jotham yells out from Mount Gerizim, Men of Shechem, who do you want to rule over you? Who are you picking? This guy basically killed all of my brothers. And, they're, and, he, and he was related to them. Can you even trust a guy that would kill his own family? It's horrible. Verses 16 through 19. Now therefore, if you've acted in good faith and integrity when you made Abimelech king, and if you dwelt well with Jeroboam and his house and have done to him as his deeds deserve, for my father fought for you, his father is who? Gideon. And risked his life and delivered you from the hand of Midian. And you have risen up against my father's house this day and have killed his sons, 70 men on one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the leaders of Shechem, because he is your relative. If you then have acted in good faith and integrity with Jeroboam and, and with his fa- house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. So Jotham, Jotham says, if you have dealt in this matter in truth and integrity, you are clean and you have nothing to worry about. But in fact, and in fact, you can rejoice. If all you've done is good, then that's fine. But the problem is that you murdered all of the other brothers. Look at verse 20. But if not, this is very prophetic, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out from the leaders of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. He's speaking prophetically. If you've done wrong, may God cause you to destroy each other. Verse 21. And Jotham ran away. Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beir, be careful with that word, and lived there because of Abimelech, his brother. So he preaches his message, and he got out of there quick. He fled to Beir. This is a city south of Shechem, and he's never heard from again. But he shared truth with them. He shared what they needed to hear. Point number three, difficulties happen. Difficulties happen. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years. This word, he ruled over Israel, literally he princed. I want you to get that. God's not going to give him kingliness here. Um, He never really was a king. You ever watch that? I look at what goes on in England a lot. It's intriguing to me. I've got a lot of my roots in England. And you watch what goes on and you see... Uh, Queen Elizabeth, who's been there like forever, like through many of our lifetimes, okay? She's still around. And you see Prince Charles, and he's just there, Prince Charles. And we hear all the things that go on in his life, you know, if you read People magazine or something. But you know, he's just a prince, and he's been a prince. And I don't think, it doesn't look like he'll ever be king. It's kind of sad. And I feel like Abimelech can say, yeah, I'm crown king, but everybody knows you're just a prince. We're just biding our time. But it's frustrating. It's got to be frustrating. And there are times when you watch evil happen, and I don't know if this ever happens for you, but you watch evil happen and you go, how long is God going to let this go on? Honestly, does it? Does certain things ever bother you? Certain things going on in our country today. Do you ever just stop and go, "Man, that's like that's going on right now," and it's okay, but it's not okay. And God is very gracious. God is very patient. He's in that, and He's that way with us too. Okay, so in case we're only looking at all these other people, they got all the black hats, and we've got all the white hats, and mm-mm. sin is. Horrible. And God is gracious, but there will come a day, and even in the New Testament economy, because everybody wants to make God like this mean guy in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, he's got a son now, which, by the way, he's always had a son, all right? And now he's a little softer. 
but it's the same God. Sin is sin. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. And so time goes on, and I know these people in Israel probably are going, what is going on? This guy, 70. Wow. Let's keep going. Verse 23, and, and God, now look at this. this is, these are the kind of verses that drive people nuts, but it's in the Bible. And God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem, and the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Did you know God is God over everything? He, God is God over Satan. Satan doesn't get to do anything. God goes, I can't believe it. he did. Satan's going crazy again. I got to do something about this. Satan needs permission. And we don't get this a lot of times. What is going on? But he's not the source of evil. But it can be used for his purposes. And that drives so many people nuts. But I'm just telling you, any other way of looking at it, God's out of control. Verse 24. That the violence... So he's dealing with the leaders of Shechem, dealt treasure with Abimelech. That the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them. And on the men of Shechem, who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers. Because of what Abimelech done, it's coming back on him. Verse 25. And the leaders of Shechem put men in ambush against him on the mountaintops. And they robbed all who passed by them along that way. And it was told to Shechem. And so we're going to... We're going to, an evil spirit comes over these men in Shechem. And they're going, this guy's not doing what he promised. This guy... And this happens, and they're just like... And so what they do is they go up in the mountaintops and in areas, and when people are coming through, they are not being protected. And so what will happen is people will complain about Abimelech because he's not being the leader that he ought to be. And so there will be dis, um, disunity. There will be problems, and this will be going on. This is what's going to take care of this situation. Verse 26 well, actually, for 25, the leaders, Shechem put men in ambush and all this stuff, and it was told to Abimelech. And then we come to verses 26 and 27, and he ra- God raises up another leader. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, moved into Shechem with his relatives, and the leaders of Shechem put confidence in them. Doesn't this sound political? One guy they raise up. Everybody's got confidence in him. Yeah, Abimelech's our man. And then this spirit of disunity, this is is just, Abimelech's not the person. And so let's get another person. We have this almost every four years in our country. There's going to be finally hope and change, or there's going to be, this guy's going to take care of us. And you see the same things that are constantly being promised. We need jobs. We need this education. Rah, 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 rah. Yeah, he's the Bernie. And you just listen, you're going, you think by now we'd go, it isn't going to be this guy who fixes us. And so Gael comes into power and they're looking, yeah, this will be the guy. Verse 27, and they went out to the field and gathered the grapes from their vineyards and trod them, so they're stomping on grapes, and held a festival, and they went in the house of their God and ate and drank and reviled Abimelech. So you can see they got all this wine, they all get together, and they're all in their house of worship. Yeah, and another thing about Abimelech. Okay, so you get the picture. And Gael, the son of Ebed, said, and I've got to get this picture here, so if you can imagine, they're all at their place of worship. And Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? And who are we of Shechem? I spilled it. Okay. That we should serve him. Is he not the son of Jeroboam? And is not Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Just a second. But why should we serve him? Would that these people were under my hand, then I would remove Abimelech. I would say to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. So we got that idea. All right. He's drunk. He's making all these complaints. 
So see what's going on. God has this person in leadership because you don't have a king in Israel. You're not doing what's right in your own eyes. What you're getting is what you deserve. You get Abimelech. What does he do? He kills people to come into power. He kills his family members to come into power. After a few years, then somebody else is raised up. Gael, he's just some drunk guy spewing out all this stuff. If I were in charge, look what happens. Verse 30. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gael, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled. And he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Behold, Gael, the son of Ebed, and his relatives have come to Shechem, and they are stirring up the city against you. Now, therefore, go by night, you and the people who are with you, and set an ambush in the field. Then in the morning... As soon as the sun is up, rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may do to them as your hand finds to do. So Abimelech and all the men who were with him rose up by night and set an ambush against Shechem in four companies. Now you're seeing here people that are not following the will of God at all. They're not praying to God. They're not seeking God. I want to, another thing I want to get your attention on. When you make plans, is God in the mix at all? Are you asking God for wisdom? And so Gael barks out all this stuff. Men of Shechem, come my way, follow me. And Zebul hears about it and secretly sends men to Abimelech. Hey, here's, and here's what you ought to do. Here's what you should do to take care of this guy, this rabble rouser, this person causing problems. And so the news gets to Abimelech, and so what does he do? He sets up and he divides into four companies, and he starts doing something. And we see more here of what he's doing. Look at verse 35. And Gael, the son of Ebed, Ebed, went out and stood in the entrance of the gate of the city. And Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from the ambush. I want you to get the picture here. And when Gael saw the people, he said to Zebal, who he thinks is his buddy, Look, people are coming down from the mountaintops. And Zebul, remember this is the guy who secretly sent word to Abimelech. Zebul said to him, you mistake the shadow of the mountains for men. Get the picture? He's lying to him. Verse 37, Gael spoke again and said, look, people are coming down from the center of the land and one company is coming from the direction of the diviner's oak. Then Zebul said to him, where's your mouth now? So it's almost like Zebul was next to him. Going, no, I think those are just shadows. And then he's like getting away from a little bit. And he goes, no, really, look, there's, and there's a guy, they're coming down from that one tree we know about. And then Zebul starts saying to him, Zebul said, verse 38, Where's your mouth now, you who said, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Are not these the people whom you despise? Go out now and fight with them. And Gael went out at the head of the leaders of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many fell wounded up to the entrance of the gate. And Abimelech lived at Aruma. And Zebul drove out Gael and his relatives so that they could not dwell at Shechem. So you're seeing all of these things going on. You're going, so God raised up or allowed this Gael to raise up, but it seems like Abimelech is still winning. What is going on? God's in charge. He's using what he's using to get done what he needs to get done. Point number four, depravity happens. Before we look at that, though, look at this verse in Proverbs 16, verse 4. If 
you could go back to that, please. Proverbs 16, verse 4. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Hard verses, but true principles. So, point number four, depravity happens. Look at verse 42. On the following day, the people went out into the field, and Abimelech was told. And he took his people and divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the fields. And he looked and saw the people coming out of the city. So he rose against them, and he killed them. Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city while the two companies rushed upon all who were in the field and killed them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He captured the city and he killed the people who were in it. And look what he does. And he raised the city and sowed it with salt. You see what's going on here? What he's saying is there are people that were part of this group that condoned his leadership. They condoned what he did to his brothers. They condoned. And the same people that at one point were loving Abimelech are now being put to death by Abimelech. And that land is so cursed that he raised the city, which basically he's destroying everything. And then he sows it with salt. And what that does is, and I'm going to make it so it's unproductive for years. It's horrible. So all those years that he was king, those three years, people are going, this is great. Things are going great. And then bad things start to happen. God's allowing it to happen. Good verse 46. When all the leaders of the tower of Shechem heard it, they entered the stronghold of the house of El Berith, that temple. Abimelech was told that all the leaders of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bundle of brushwood and took it up and laid it on his shoulder. And he said to the men who were with him, what you have seen me do, hurry and do as I have done. So we've got Abimelech going up and he goes up into the woods. He cuts down this wood And he says, now all of you do the exact same thing. And so they do it. And look what he's going to do. So every one of the people cut down his bundle and followed Abimelech, put it against the stronghold. So this is that temple. And they set the stronghold on fire over them so that all the people of the Tower of Shechem also died, about a thousand men and women. Remember when I was first thinking about coming to Warrington. I was doing searches on what the history of Warrington was. And one of the most historical things, and you could even go into the Warren County Historical Society building there in town. And it's really, actually really cool to find out some of the history of our town. But one of the most horrible things that happened in this town was there was a retirement home or a home, Katie home or whatever, that caught on fire. In fact, there's a gentleman that I see in McDonald's regularly that actually was a custodian at the time. He's 80s into his 90s. He was a, as a young man, he worked there. And he won't, uh, says, people tell him, you don't want to ask him about it. It still shakes him up because the fire was horrible. It was a, it was a brick building that the floors had been varnished like crazy. And it caught on fire, and it was like an oven that just was. And they could not get them out of there. It was horrible what was going on. They said that there were, I think the owner even lived in the Montgomery City area or that area. He, they could see the flames from that far away. It was just horrible what was going on. And it, that picture came to my mind when I was thinking about what Abimelech did back then, where purposefully... They did this, and they set this place on fire. A thousand people died. But Jotham told him. 
He told them this would happen. He prophesied that this would happen. If this is the person that you set up as king in your life, he's going to ultimately burn you, literally. As, and this is what happens. And this is what happens in our life when we, the, the thoughts and the hopes and the things that we put into stuff that is not of the Lord. The Bible even talks about in the final judgment, what the Christian will be judged for is not our sins. I want you to remember that. We're not going to be judged for our sins. We're going to be judged for this. What did we do with Jesus? Wood, hand, stubble, as opposed to gold, silver, and precious stones. And it all just burns up. And if the king of my life is Jesus and every aspect of my life is turned over to him, then what burns up doesn't matter anyways. But what stands is what um, needs to stand. Oh, point number five, last point this morning. Death happens. Death happens. So the wheels of justice grind, but they grind, they grind slowly, but they grind finally. And we see here, in, beginning at verse 50, what goes on. And look at this. Then Abimelech went to Thebes, so he's feeling all powerful and stuff. I'm cleaning house here. And camped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city. And all the men and women and all the leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in. And they went up to the roof of the tower. So get that picture. He's already done what he's done in Shechem. He's making his way to Thebes. And these people come and they're, they're so scared. They run to this tower. And they may have grabbed some things that they thought this may be useful later. Maybe not. But we'll see something in a moment that may make us think that way. And we come to verse 52. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. So this guy's a real pyro, okay? This is his thing, you know? He, ent- he goes to that door because he's thinking, well, I'm going to do to these people. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. So maybe this lady was like, well, we might be up there for a while. I don't know. Bring something that would grind wheat. I don't know what she's thinking. Or maybe there's just some um, sovereignly set up upper millstone right there at the top of the tower. And this lady, she doesn't have to be much of an athlete. She just takes it over and lets gravity do its thing. Isn't it interesting how often there's like deadly women in the Bible? It has to make us think, be cool, guys, all right? So let's keep going. Come on. Okay. <laughs> they know where we sleep, all right? Um, and so she comes, they come down, and a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Now, this, is, this, this next part is, it's not funny, but it's just kind of ironic, but it's kind of funny. All right. So, verse 54, then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me, a woman killed him. I want you to look at the previous verse. They're saying it. Even though you did this, it doesn't matter for the rest of history. They're going to remember millstone on your head. Not sword, but you're going, because he's so, isn't it interesting how proud we can be? The last thing I want you to know about me. I've, I've had people that I've heard how they want things to be covered concerning what they look like in their casket. I mean, in ways that like, you know, how their hair needs to be and stuff. And I know, okay, it's important somewhat. All right. But the reality is you're dead. All right. People, oh, they look so good. No, they're dead. All right. Oh. The things we I hear at funerals, all right? But he says, say this, lest they say a woman killed him. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel, look at, the, look at, look at how, what loyalty. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone departed to his home. Now think about that. Really? That's it? But you're like, all right, dead. Right. Life goes on. 
When we're gone, you know the whole, the whole thing about our impact. If you want to know how important are you, take a bucket, fill it with water, put your fist in there, pull it out, and however long it takes to fill that little area, that's how important we are. All right? Really? Yeah. So what are you investing in? What am I investing in? Who is my king? Who do you want to be your king? Abimelech thought, I'm Abimelech. My name means son of the king. I'm going to, I'm going to be king, and I'm going to kill 70 people to do this, and they're my brothers. And look where he is now. And look how he died. And look what he's remembered for. He's not that big of a deal. Thus, verse 56, thus God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. God remembers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. I don't know if you ever watched the speeches. I, I'm intrigued by the Third Reich of what went on there and how people bought a lie and how easy it is. And he'll speak and he's got this bad haircut and a goofy looking mustache and, and people are like, this is it. And you watch people and then just the adoration. Screaming out hatred of God's people. And he thought he was I'm going to, the third Reich, the third kingdom. And he dies in a bunker with Eva, commits suicide, and he ends up all burned up. We're not that big of a deal. And all the stuff that we're...